My name is Kristen Knight Pace, and I am an author of a memoir, This Much Country, um, which is about running both thousand mile sled dog races that exist in the world today, the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest. And I'm also a wilderness coordinator for the National Park Service. So I work for Denali National Park and Preserve and Gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve, both in Alaska. I'm also a mom of two babies. Um, My daughter Ada is three and my son Whitman just turned 10 months old yesterday. And did, did you originally grow up in Alaska? No, I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas and made my way north steadily um, over the years after I graduated from high school and finally ended up in Alaska in 2009. Did you have a dream about dog racing and mushing? Was that when did you first hear about that or come across it? Um, so I, I kind of became familiar with it when I accepted an internship at the Denali National Park Sled Dog Kennels in 2006, and it was the year I graduated from college. So right out of college, I got that internship, and I had just gotten my degree in photojournalism, and my thesis project was on working dogs. I had always been fascinated with dogs that have a job. And I had never really interacted with sled dogs before. So when I got the offer for that internship, I was so excited to just expand my <laughs> my world in terms of working dogs. And as soon as I got there, I just fell in love with all of the park service sled dogs, which are these huge freight dogs up to, you know, 120, 130 pounds, the biggest ones. And um, and immediately I knew this had to be a part of my life. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. And I can't wait to talk about your, your dogs. But before we get into to more of that story, does it all start in 2009? Would you say that's when it all sort of started for you? So um, I would say yes. 2009 was when that era of my life started. And of course, it as you probably read in the book, it started with a massive <laughs> heartbreak. Um, and so that's basically what catapulted me into a life in Alaska. Yeah, let's. I'd love to. Let's talk not about the heartbreak. Let's talk about Alaska and moving to live in your friend's cabin outside of the Denali National Park in exchange for housing, where you're going to take care of your friend's um, sled dogs. I'd love to hear more about that initial experience and what it was like, you know, being in the wilderness, being in Alaska. Oh wow, that was such a formative time for me. And it was so crucial. And, um, you know, driving from I was in Montana at the time that my friend had called and said, Hey, there's a guy who, who, you know, really needs somebody to watch his sled dogs for the winter. And I said, Yes, okay, I'll be there in a month. And so I drove from Montana to Alaska at the very end of October in 2009. And my dad came with me. And I was, I was 26 years old at the time. And, you know, it was pretty funny to like, I felt like an overgrown child for sure. But I, you know, was dead set on going north and basically starting my life over um, having just been left by my husband at the time. And my dad was, I mean, my whole family was super worried about me. And they didn't want me to be spending you know, the first months of my divorce in the darkest, coldest place on earth (laughs) alone in a cabin. And so my dad, um, you know, drove all the way up to Alaska with me. And I think the whole time was probably like, this is a bad idea. You know, like I'm going to be here in case we get there and she changes her mind. And when we arrived at that cabin, I will never forget pulling up the driveway. It was a packed snow. It was dark, million stars. And, um, the, the cabin was basically right on the edge of a vast tundra plain with mountains all around. And it had twinkle lights in the windows, like Christmas lights. And I was just like, I've been looking at pictures of this place for a month by this point, like every day, religiously studying these photos, imagining what my life would be. And then when we finally arrived there, I was just like, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be. 
So that was an incredible feeling to get to crunch our way through the cold, squeaky snow up to the front door and open the door of this little cabin that was going to be mine. And um, man, it just felt like a, a new beginning. It was exactly what I needed. I needed a lot of quiet time to kind of marinate in my sadness and deal with my emotions and figure out who I really was alone. And it was such a gift that first winter in that cabin with those sled dogs. I, I had eight sled dogs to care for along with my two dogs, Moose and Maximus. So it was just me and 10 dogs in this little tiny one room cabin. And it was the time of my life. You know, I kind of discovered who I really was. In terms of processing your your feelings, how are you doing that? Was that, you know, you're a writer. Was it journaling? Was it writing about it? Uh, was it just trying to forget about it and focus on the 10 dogs? You know, how did you get through that winter? Well, I try to write at least once a week. And I spent a lot of time walking around outside in the, in the snow with these dogs. Like it would just be a big loose pack of 10 dogs and me tromping around in the snow. And I, I couldn't ignore it. Like I couldn't ignore the defeat of being left or the heartache of my husband leaving me. Um, so I really had to just process it. And I had these very loving companions who didn't judge me for experiencing and feeling every emotion as it came. And I never had to hide anything that I was feeling. So it was an incredibly purifying experience that allowed me to grow so much. And I discovered exactly what I loved and what I didn't like. And I kind of got to reacquaint myself with myself. And um, the dogs in all of their <laughs> love and, you know, non-judgment really fostered that in me. So writing about things is how I process my emotions more than anything, but also spending time moving outside is a place where my mind really can wander and work things out. So the combination of those two things really allowed me to move through that heartache and kind of turn it into something beautiful. And would the dogs be sleeping in the cabin with you or would just be would just Moose and Maximus be sleeping in the cabin with you? Oh, there was just a pile of dogs. Oh. I mean, it was. And so my little bed was up these steep stair, like these like a ladder almost that went to a sleeping loft upstairs. And Moose and Maximus, <laughs> the first the first night we were there, Moose got up those stairs and Moose is a giant. I mean, he he was you know, a hundred pound dog that could put his paws up on my shoulders when he stood on his hind legs. He, and I'm five foot 10. He, I mean, he was just this massive dog. So he ran up the, those ladder stairs and got stuck up there. And after that, the dogs all stayed downstairs. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was uh, just a pile of fur. I've just got this vision of like this rustic cabin and, you know, the log fire with the flames and just all these amazing dogs surrounding you, like cuddling up to you. I'm just like, oh, it sounds amazing. Um, I'd, love, <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to talk more about dog mushing. Now, I hope I'm saying that right, being a dog musher. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about what that is and how you got into the sport, where it all started for you. Sure. Um, so dog mushing, the word mush comes from the French marsh, like to march forward. Uh, maybe it's marche. I definitely don't speak French. <laughs> um, but that's kind of how that word um, came to be in English. But um, we a lot of us just call yeah, mushing or dog sledding. And um, it's a traditional way of travel in Alaska it preceded the snow machine or the snowmobile, which was invented in 1960. And most families in Alaska up until that point of 1960 had a little dog team in the backyard. And it was um, the way that the mail was delivered um, all the way through to, I want to say the mid sixties in Alaska. And of course, most people have heard of the famous serum run 
from Nanana to Nome um, during the diphtheria pandemic there that ended up saving the lives of, of that whole entire town. The sled dogs are just not only a, it's not just a sport, it's an entire way of life. It's an entire lifestyle. And I think that, you know, I knew that to a certain extent, at, like during my summer internship at the Denali National Park sled dog kennels, I, you know, p- participated in sled dog demos in the summer with a wheeled sled that went around a little gravel track and we would um, put the dogs in all of the traditional old leather harnesses for show. They're historic um, gear that we used. And people would ask questions about the traditional mode of travel and what sled dogs were used for in Denali. Um, It was the only, and it still is, the only sled dog kennel in the National Park Service. And it's a working kennel. So I knew a lot about that, but I hadn't lived the lifestyle until that winter in 2009. And I really understood what it meant because it was you lived and breathed these dogs. You'd get up first thing in the morning, heat up water, get their kibble and their meat. Like they they have raw meat. A lot, they need a lot of calories. <laughs> um, you get their food thawed and ready and bring it out to them and feed them and then scoop poop. And then it's time for exercise and then another snack and then heat up dinner and then, you know, give them fresh straw and get ready to do it all over again in the morning. And, you know, it really is every aspect of your life has to do with these dogs. And so that first winter, I was, I was not a dog musher, I wouldn't say, but I was someone who cared for sled dogs and got to learn so much about them. And it wasn't until the following winter when I got hired to be one of the mushers for the National Park Service that I could really call myself a dog musher. And um, that's, you know, a whole nother thing. (laughs) Uh, You know, not only caring for those dogs and everything that you do, but also getting to hook them up to the dog sled and witness their power and their joy for what they do. And just this unstoppable energy um, and accomplishing tasks together and working together as a team to achieve things. That was a whole new world to me. So um, that right there was kind of what propelled me into starting my own kennel, running my first sled dog races, and ultimately finishing the Yukon Quest and the Iditarod. Let's talk about those races because they are just iconic. Which, which one came first for you? Which was your first big race that you did? So my first thousand mile race was in 2015 and it was the Yukon Quest. And that year it went a thousand miles from Whitehorse, Yukon Territory, Canada to Fairbanks, Alaska. Woo! Thousand miles. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> what is that like? Like, how does it work with the dogs and managing it? Are there checkpoints along? Are you self-sufficient? What sort of speed are you going? What sort of distances are you covering? What are the biggest challenges that you face on this quest? Well, it really is a quest in every way. And you have to be, first of all, doing it for the right reasons like slogging along for a thousand miles, which in my case took 12 days is not something you do for other people's approval for looking cool (laughs) for, for anything except for an incredible amount of like mental fortitude and needing to prove something to yourself. And also just joy of traveling with dogs. And for me, that was the biggest reason I I wanted to just see some country, you know, I mean, ever since I was a kid, I was always wondering what's just behind these mountains or I'd climb to the top of a mountain and be like, Oh, I wish I could see what was the next mountain range over. I mean, I, I always wanted to know what was around the bend and here was a chance to immerse myself in the biggest, broadest, wildest country there is. And so first of all, that was the dream. And then uh, the reality was race day dawned 40 below zero, both Fahrenheit and Celsius. And the Yukon River was still partially open. So 
we started the race in like a vapor. I mean, like all the, the open water on the Yukon river was like making a steam in the air because it was so cold. And so I, I took off with these 14 dogs who were just raring to go in absolute freezing cold temperatures. And, um, I was like, okay, wow, this is the reality. This is going to be ex- an extremely cold race. And like, now I'm completely on my own. So the Yukon quest is nine checkpoints over the course of a thousand miles. And the checkpoints are up to 200 miles apart. And so in between those checkpoints, you're completely self-sufficient. You're camping on the side of the trail. You're building a little fire and snuggling into the straw with your dogs you're not sleeping in a tent. You're not sleeping in like so, there's some hospitality stops along the way, which are just the best. I mean, I can't even the northern shelter cabin culture is a thing unto itself. But basically imagine traveling for three days without seeing another soul and then arriving, like, you know, seeing a light in the distance on the side of a totally remote wild Alaskan river and pulling up to that little cabin light and walking inside to a warm meal and people saying, come on in. I, we made homemade sourdough bread and moose stew and you can sleep in my bed and I'll wake you up when you're, when your rest is over. <laughs> I mean, like you just can't imagine the relief of, of these kind, wonderful souls who take you into their, into their, into their home in the middle of nowhere during this epic race. So you you start off on the Yukon Quest with 14 dogs and those are your that's your team. You don't get to trade anybody out. You don't ever get to add new dogs to your team. It's those 14 dogs. So these are dogs that you have been running thousands of miles of training with up until this point. Like we usually trained 2 to 3,000 miles before starting the race. And so you wanted to be able to to show your dogs everything you could possibly see in a race during training so that you're not asking them to do something they've never done before at race time. And um, so this is a team that you are tight with at this point. And you know everybody's strengths and weaknesses, and you've put this team together knowing that this is the best possible team to tackle this journey with you. For me, I started with 14 dogs. And I finished with 12 because Kebab, one of my amazing little leaders, went into flaming heat right in like smack in the middle of the race and drove all the boys crazy. And I was like, I have an uncontrollable junk show right now of a dog team. Like they were just turning around and looking at her and trying to get her. And I was like, okay, Kebab, (laughs) it's time. You're going home. So I I left her with my husband and the rest of my handlers in Dawson City, which is the halfway point of the race, 500 miles in. And then Norton, whose story is in the book, was this giant 70 pound boy who had his paw had gone right into a crack in the Yukon River and he tweaked his shoulder. And I was like, Norton, I don't think you can run anymore. He was limping and I was carrying him in the sled, which was a trial in itself. And um, ultimately the veterinarians and Eagle were like, he's totally fine. We can't find anything. I think he's, you know, worked through it. We, you know, his shoulder seems great, but I did not want a chance having to carry him in my sled ever again, because it was such a nightmare. So Norty got to fly home on a little plane (laughs) from Eagle And yeah, the rest of my team finished with me and, um, gosh, it was just, I think about it almost every day, that very first thousand mile race experience and just how magical and special it was. Yeah. What do you think you learned from that experience that you applied to other areas of your life? Well, I will say that at the end of the race, like as I saw the finish line coming into view, I kind of subconsciously stopped my team. Like we started going really slow and then I just stopped and looked at the finish line in the distance and was like, do I really want to go back to this <laughs> to, to regular life? I mean, I, I wanted to just turn around and go right back out there. Um, and I think what the quest taught me was, first of all, that I'm much more stubborn and willful than I ever knew. 
and that I was tougher than I ever knew. It ended up being the coldest Yukon quest in history. And it was 68 degrees below zero at the coldest point. Um, and I was camping out in that. I was sleeping on the ground in that with my dogs. And I, you know, I was like, it's all relative. It's all, you know, depending on your attitude, it's so much of it is mental. And I realized that I had an incredible mental fortitude and that I could, I could endure or tolerate most anything. And that was really important knowledge for me to know. But I think also the thing I've taken with me up to this point is not to settle for a life that is anything less than an adventure like that. Something that's challenging and rewarding and the every day you're like, what the hell am I doing? But in the best way. And, and, you know, you're learning all of the time. I think, you know, coming into the finish line and having to let other people into my experience was really difficult. And I learned that that experience is a sacred thing that I can hold and that I can recreate in different ways in my life and, and still just like hold tight to those values of not settling into a normal life or a boring life and, and keeping it interesting. (laughs) Tell me about Andy. How did you meet? Well, the first time I ever saw Andy, I had just driven off the road in a snowstorm. I slid off the road. Um, And he happened to be working a late shift at the park dispatch center, which is, you know, they, they man the radios. So all the, the park rangers out on patrol and the pilots flying around always call in to the communication center and to the dispatchers. And so that was Andy's job. And, um, at the time, and he (laughs) was coming home from a late shift and was able to help dig me out of the ditch on the side of the road. And, um, I thought he was so handsome and I couldn't really see his whole face because it was around Christmas time. It was super dark, you know, the winter solstice shortest day of the year. And we all had headlamps on so I could just see the bottom half of his face. And um, (laughs) I was like, wow, that guy's really hot. (laughs) (laughs) I'd spent the entire winter alone. So I hadn't really gotten to engage in any kind of, you know, love life. And, um, And so, yeah, I saw him was like, wow, that guy's really hot. I hope I see him again. And then a couple of months went by and Tor, one of the dogs um, that worked at the Denali sled dog kennel, had gotten in a fight with another dog like 43 miles out from the trailhead in Denali. So they were my friend Jess called me from a sat phone 43 miles away. And was like, Tor just got in this huge fight and his tooth is like dangling from his jaw and I need someone to take him to the vet. So can you meet us at the park headquarters? You know, I'm going to mush him all the way out there and you meet us there and then take him to the vet in Fairbanks, which is two hours away, two and a half hours away. So I was like, no problem. You know, I had known Tor for a long time. Um, He was there when I first had that internship in 2006. So at this point I had you know, Tor and I had gone back a few years and Jess was comfortable with me taking him. And so <laughs> the person who came and picked picked us up, picked Tor and I up to go to the vet in Fairbanks was this incredibly handsome dispatcher. <laughs> and uh, I saw him in the rear. View. I was sitting in the back seat and I looked in the rear view mirror at his face and was like, oh, my God, it's that super hot guy. And I got so embarrassed and was like I could barely even look at him. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. Spending a winter in like basic social isolation, then all of a sudden being thrown into a car with this incredibly handsome man. And then we spent, you know, hours in the veterinary um, office together waiting while Tor had his surgery. And during those hours, we just talked and talked and we learned some pretty amazing things about each other. And chief among those things was the fact that both of us had been through seven year relationships that ended and our reaction to those endings was driving alone to Alaska in the middle of winter. (laughs) And so we just stared at each other after we came to this realization that we both had done the same crazy thing. And um, it seemed to be some 
something internal that clicked there that was like a recognition of of kinship amongst each other oh my god it's like a Mills and Boone novel like Christmas time <laughs> he dug you out the snow <laughs> three months later he's driving you to the to the vets oh my god I'm moving to Alaska <laughs> <laughs> And now you're yeah, married and, got, and now you're married and you've got like two gorgeous babies. Oh, and you started a kennel. <laughs> anyway, I'm getting all emotional. Uh, everyone will have to read the book. So <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit more about what life is like for you at the moment. So you've got the hay moose kennel. You've got babies. How do you survive in Alaska in the wild with the cold? Like how do you even go outside when it's that cold? Well, that's been a huge challenge. And I think, you know, right now we're just kind of on pause with with racing and living the insanity of the homestead life um, because it just got so hard. So just to give you an idea, um, our cabin is it, it just got a driveway like we put the driveway in ourselves when I was pregnant with Ada. And um, all the years before that, we'd been walking into our house and the house didn't have electricity when we first bought it. And we put that in ourselves. And even though we finally got the driveway just before Ada was born, that whole winter and the following winter after that, we didn't have road access for months at a time because where we live um, out there in Healy is like the wind just howls and blows the snow across the road and the drifts pile up so quickly that there's like a phone tree on our street where as soon as this one particular wind starts blowing right when there's this particular amount of snow, the whole neighborhood has to get out. And, um, you know, we all call each other and say, it's time, the road's closing in, got to get out. And so you drive all the cars out together out to a mile away to the end of the street and park them in a neighbor's driveway that's like out on the main road that gets plowed and then either walk back home or ski back home or snow machine back home. And we did this with babies. I mean, we tucked Ada into our parka and walked out to our car for doctor's appointments. And when, by the time Whitman came along or by the time I was pregnant with Whitman, we had a snow machine, which made it a little bit easier. But every day I'd have to have my little two-year-old daughter um, in her snowsuit, in her mask, like sitting in front of me, holding on to the snow machine for dear life while I gunned it over these drifts that are five feet tall. <laughs> and finally, it was like, you know, this used to be really exciting, doing this and hauling water in and like doing everything via dog team or via snow machine. But now it's just driving us insane it's so hard like raising a baby and hauling water in for 30 dogs and then heating up water on the stove to wash your baby in a bucket and I mean we didn't have running water you know we we had an outhouse and um it's it, it was just <laughs> an incredibly difficult way to live so we ran the 2019 Yukon Quest and I was pregnant with Whitman and Ada was two and so that was 2,600 miles of driving the dog truck for me and then 1,000 miles of mushing for Andy because he ran it that year. And um, I'll never forget being like, I was like in the throes of first trimester morning sickness. So I was like, like <laughs> you know, puking in the, in the checkpoints and like, oh God, it, I was so exhausted and so tired and so sick. And at the end of that race, I was like, Andy, I am like, this isn't even fun anymore. And he was like, I know the whole time I just felt <laughs> guilty that you were on the road with Ada. But also I was just counting down the hours until I'd be done. And obviously, like I said at the beginning, you know, that's not the headspace you want to be in when you're running a thousand mile race. Like not only is it unfair to you, but it's incredibly unfair to the dogs. And they need to have the best of you. And if you can't give them the best of you, then you don't deserve those dogs. <laughs> and so we came to some really hard realizations after the 2019 quest. And so we talked to all of our best friends who are all in my book. So it was Brent Sass, Paige Drobny, Ryan Olson, and Jeff King. 
And we told them, you guys, I think we need to take a break from this. And they were all like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, we can't believe that you've been doing, like that you've still been persevering through this lifestyle with these children. And um, so right now um, our dog team is split amongst those folks um, who we love so much. They're all like, you know, daily in daily contact with us. But our dogs, our team just finished um, the 2020 Iditarod and the 2020 Yukon Quest, either in the winning team or in the top five of both races. So they just killed it. And we're so proud of them. <laughs> but we obviously, you know, like just watching them succeed and do such an amazing job made us realize that we made the right decision in letting our friends have them to do this incredible thing that they were born to do because we couldn't give them the life that they deserved anymore because of all of the, the work and the attention that our children needed. So we still have, you know, our old tried and true <laughs> um, original dogs. We have Solo, Zigzag, Kebab, Littlehead, and Piper. But everybody else is running with our friends right now. Living their best life. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, I mean, like, incredibly heartbreaking for us to have to make that decision for the time being, but also just such a relief to know that, you know, they're with people that don't have the other demands in their life that we do in terms of children and they can give everything to those dogs. And that's what the dogs deserve. Yeah. Are there many women who are in do dog mushing, dog sled sledding? Like, are, is there like a good solid female contingent is, you know, what's it like there being a woman in that sport? Yes, there are. Um, I want to say the 2018 or 2019 Iditarod had the most, the highest percentage of women so far sign up, which is really cool. Um, and then also the junior Iditarod, which is almost more important to pay attention to. These are kids that are aged 14 to 17. I want to say eight out of the nine mushers were girls and the winner was a girl. I literally so, like, yes. <laughs> um, yes. All of us were like, yes, like the up and comers represent. So that was super exciting to see, to see that development. But yes, I would say, so among so my best friends are dog mushers and women and men. Um, but you know, Paige and Ryan are, we talk to each other, 20 times a day every day for for like six years straight and um it's there's no sense of like bitchiness or rivalry or anything like that it's like 100 percent support and encouragement and it's basically the for me anyway like this idyllic world that you want to see is like women supporting each other and women boosting each other up and um, competing on a level playing field with men. There's no women's mushing versus men's mushing. It's all women and men together competing on the level playing field. And all that matters is who's a better dog driver and who has better dogs. And so I, I think it's, it's a pretty, you know, obviously it's a rare, <laughs> you can't find many people who run both the Iditarod and the Yukon Quest in the world. It's like more people have summited Mount Everest than run the Iditarod, finish the Iditarod, I should say. But of all those people that have finished both races, there are about, at this point, I think 35 women who have finished both. And every one of those women is an awesome human. And you know, a very supportive person and we all rally around each other. So um, it's just a really cool group of people that work tirelessly and that understand each other at this elemental level. Yeah. What makes a good dog driver? So <laughs> this, this is something that probably a lot of us are still struggling to answer, <sighs> even though, you know, we've been in the sport for a very long time. But I'm lucky to have learned from the best. And um, I, <laughs> Jeff King, my my first mentor, he's the winningest musher of all time. Um, and he won the Iditarod four times. Um, he always said to me, calm and assertive, calm and assertive. Like the dogs 
need to see that from you because they need to be able to trust you. And if you freak out about something or if you start panicking or if you are, if you act at all, like you're not in control of the situation, they're going to all of a sudden have realize that there's a leadership vacuum to fill and then they'll take it upon themselves and they might not make the best decisions. And you know, it's never the dog's fault what situation you end up in. It's your fault. You're the one who put the team there. And so I think the best dog drivers are calm and assertive and they have a great sense of humor because you wouldn't believe what can go wrong. I mean, maybe you can because you've read the book, <laughs> but but there are so many situations that you're like, how did this happen? And you have to keep your cool. Otherwise, if the dog sends you know, a panicked or bad energy, they might all turn on each other and start fighting or they might take off and never look back. And then you're standing there alone, you know, with your hat in your hand and everything you need to survive in your dog sled that's running away from you. You know, there's, there's so much that can happen. So I think people who are calm, assertive, very positive, have a good sense of humor, but I think also to have a great eye for detail. Um, You have to be able to pay attention to every last dog on that line and be able to look at them and notice if something is off. Dogs are so stoic. They don't tell you anything. And so it's totally up to you to pay attention and to read them and to see like, Hmm, you know, like Solo is kind of acting like he doesn't want to be in lead anymore. Or Littlehead is not doing a great job eating her dinner. Like, I wonder what's going on. And you have to really, I mean, like, you have to zero in on all these little details. And if you're, a, you know, easily distracted or if you're not able to focus or if being super hungry or super cold or super wet and tired, you know, distracts you from being able to give those dogs the support they need, then you're not going to end up being very successful. How fast do the dogs end up going? Because, you know, they are they're big dogs. And when you've got like eight or 10 of them tied up, that's a huge amount of speed. And, and what's it like, like, I, I suppose, almost trying to describe what that feeling is like being pulled along at that speed through the snow and the trees? Could Could you try and verbalize that <laughs> <laughs> yeah well so first of all I had 15 dogs <gasps> on my I did a rod team and that was probably the most terrifying moment of my life hooking that team up at the start line of I did a rod 2016 and you know looking at my little sw- my little sled just swiveling on its rope with 15 athletes that had just run the Yukon quest with Andy three weeks before. So they were just like top of their game, like Olympic athlete dogs. So our dogs are, we're pretty big for racing Alaskan Huskies, like the ones of the park service hauled freight. So they're very big and slow and strong. And they are bred for breaking trail where there is no trail and for hauling big timbers and heavy, you know, pieces of equipment to remote cabins. Whereas Alaskan Huskies bred for racing, especially thousand mile races are oftentimes smaller and lighter and might have a little bit of a shorter coat because they're running a hundred miles a day as opposed to like 10 miles a day, which is what a lot of the freight dogs end up doing, you know, between 10 and 30 miles a day, depending on the conditions. So Alaskan Huskies who race are going 100 miles a day and our dogs were between 40 and 80 pounds. And that's pretty big for Alaskan Huskies that are racing dogs like Ryan's dogs for the most part were much smaller than mine. Um, Paige's dog's about the same. So yeah, having all that power (laughs) and you don't, your steering is your lead dogs. And so a lot of people um, I've talked to since my book came out didn't realize that, that you don't have reins or anything like you would with a horse. All you have is your voice command to these dogs. And so you have this incredible amount of power and this power (laughs) that only knows going forward. The only thing that you, you have to stop the team or slow them down is the brakes on your sled. And so you're basically standing on 
a pad break, which is a piece of snow machine track. It's like that super, it's almost like a piece of tire rubber with bolts and spikes in it that like add a lot of friction. So when you stand on top of it, it's a, it's called like a drag mat. Like it slows the team down. And then you have this metal bar break over the top of that that's lifted and you can stomp down on it if you need to, but it has two metal spikes in it, like teeth. Um, and then last of all, you have your snow hook, which is attached to the bridle of the sled um, where your dog team is attached. And um, you can take that and put it into the snow and stomp it in with your foot. And that's basically the only way you can stop. So imagine you're me in the 2016 Iditarod and you have a team of 15 dogs and you have these three tools with which to stop them and no snow. Like now, what do you do? So you're basically on this moving vehicle which if you can't slow the team down, you're going close to 15, maybe 20 miles an hour at the very fastest. Like we try to settle into a pace of about eight or nine miles an hour on average for the whole thousand miles. That's like a winning pace is if you can go eight or nine miles an hour for the whole race as an average, that's pretty amazing. Um, But if you're chasing a wild animal or going down a mountain, (laughs) you're good. (laughs) getting pretty fast. (laughs) So, um, so it takes an incredible amount of upper body strength. You have to hold onto that sled for dear life, but also it takes a lot of just like, you know, having to put your, the force of your entire body on that brake and just push down. And sometimes you're even pulling up on the handlebar while pushing down on the brake with your feet, trying everything, like all your whole entire body is trying to slow them down to keep them at a pace that is (laughs) <laughs> controllable. And there are so many parts of the Iditarod that are super technical. You're spinning around trees that are huge. You're taking 90 degree turns onto, onto ice bridges over running water, um, skidding everywhere, slamming into bumpers that the trail crew has put up. So you don't just go right into the river itself, going up and down mountains, like falling straight down mountain faces. It's intense. And you have to I mean, to do that with even six dogs would be would take a lot of a lot of skill. So doing that with like 15 or 16 dogs is you have to be at the top of your game. Is there a maximum amount of dogs that you're allowed to have? Yes. Um, right now. So we just we the finishers of Iditarod voted a couple of years ago to make the maximum number of dogs 14, which is the same for the Yukon Quest. So it's right as of right now, the maximum number is 14 for both races. So you have, you've written an incredible book, This Much Country, a memoir, which was released in March 2020. How was that journey of, of writing that memoir, writing that book, writing that story? It was, it was, it was amazing. Um, there was a lot of serendipity involved. Um, I, right after I had finished the Iditarod in 2016, we had my husband and I, mostly me and my friend Katie Orlinski, who's a New York Times photographer and a National Geographic photographer, were featured in a documentary um, at Tribeca Film Festival. And so I finished the Iditarod at the end of March 2016. And then April, like the first week of April, we were we were flown to New York City to, to the red carpet. It was so otherworldly and surreal. And our documentary was debuted on the big screen there at Tribeca and then Sarah Jessica Parker led the forum like led the panel discussion afterward and that was <laughs> totally wild um and crazy and it was just a wonderful time and a really crazy time for me because that very same day I learned I was pregnant and so I was like holy shit like life just continues to be a whirlwind so while we were in New York I met up with an old friend who worked at that outdoor adventure camp for girls with me. She was a counselor with me and she lived right there in in New York city. And so we took a long walk across the Brooklyn bridge and got to talking. And, you know, I was telling her about the last several years of my life (laughs) and, um, and she, her sister was an editor and Allie said, you know, I think that you should write a book about, your experiences, you know, I had a blog at the time that a lot of my friends read. And so she had read my writing and she believed that it could be 
you know, a worthwhile pursuit. And I had a degree in journalism. And so, you know, writing was a really um, foundational part of who I was at that point. And so Whitney called me um, while I was still in New York and said, here's what I need you to do. Write me an email (laughs) summarizing this era of your life and, you know, basically telling us what happened in a succinct way and then attach a bunch of writing samples and we need to find you an agent. So I was like, okay. So I did that right away and I sent that to her and she said, okay, this is, this is perfect. I'm going to send this to my favorite agent first. And then if she doesn't take it, I'm going to send it to a handful of other people that I really like that I think could, you know, could do something with this. She sent, you know, the email to her favorite agent and made an introduction. And then I had a phone interview with that agent and she signed me. And so then the process began of writing the book and it was about a year to get the proposal down. And the proposal was like 65 pages of the book and then an outline of the rest. So it was like chapters one through four or something. And then an outline of what the rest of the book would look like. And then once that was perfected, she shopped it around to a bunch of publishers and I got some great rejection letters <laughs> <laughs> that were that were super detailed about why and really encouraging. And then I got and she had my agent Brittany had always had a feeling that Maddie Caldwell at Grand Central Publishing would be just the right person for this book because she loved dogs and she was from Wyoming and had a sense of wide open spaces and outdoor adventures. And she she was totally right. I mean, Maddie and I hit it off like we had been lifelong friends. Grand Central Publishing bought the book and I got to work with Maddie over the following year, editing and writing and finishing the book. And she was just such an amazing guide. And, um, It was really, it was not lost on me at all that this amazing team of women was producing this book. And so I really loved that, that it was (laughs) uh, just an awesome team of encouraging people, cheering each other on. It was just a really exciting time to, to be writing the book. So the memoir came out in hardcover in March 2019 and then just came out in paperback in March 2020. Yeah, it's it's been wild. I've been like, I had my first live interview on NPR, which was terrifying. And I sweated through my clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and there's been so many amazing opportunities to talk to people. And um, being on your podcast is so exciting. And I'm so honored. And um, yeah, it's just been, it's just opened up a whole new world of people to me that I never would have otherwise met. So I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. And Kristen, where's the best place that people can find more information out about you and your book and what your life is like now? <laughs> well, um, so my our Instagram is Kristen Knight Pace is my handle. And um, our heymoosekennel.com website has all of the dogs on there and everybody's pictures and stories. Um, and then also kristennightpace.com is where you can find information about the book and, and different speaking events and things like that. So yeah, that's that's where you can find me. We're on Facebook a bit too, but more Instagram these days. It's a little bit more of a positive place. <laughs> <laughs> so, and Kristen, I'd love for you to leave um, everyone with just final words of advice, final words of wisdom from what you've learned over the past, um, is it 11 years now? Yeah, 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, gosh, I, I would say not settling for less than what you really know that you're truly capable of whether that's in I mean call me a romantic or whatever but like I'm so glad I didn't settle for anything less than than the movie version (laughs) you know like I'm so glad that I was surrounded by I guess that would be it surround yourself with people who believe in your dream with you and who are willing to support you and not be a naysayer and you know, who want to be along for your adventure, because you can't do it. I mean, you can do it all by yourself. But really, gosh, it's so much better and easier if you have a team of people, you know, a chosen family that believes in your dreams with you and that encourages you to accomplish them. 
I hope you sent a copy of your book to Reese Witherspoon because I could, you know, that would make an your the book would make an amazing movie. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We talked. Um, there is there is a studio that is interested in representing it for movie rights, so that was pretty exciting. But you know how the world is these days; it's the dumpster fire. <laughs> So uh, it's the least important thing right now, but maybe someday in the future, that would be just an incredible thing to witness. Kristen, thank you so much for coming on the Tough Girl podcast to share more about your journey and your new book. Um, It's so, so exciting. And I can't wait for other people to read it and to be inspired. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a, a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you so much for listening to that episode with Kristen. My name is Sarah Williams. I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast. Find out more information about Kristen and to see the show notes, please do go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com. That is basically the main central hub where you can find out loads of information about me, the different adventures and challenges that I've done, as well as all of our previous guests and future guests that we have coming on the show. So new episodes are every Tuesday at 7 a.m. UK time. Just want to give you two recommendations if you're particularly interested in Alaska. So I would highly recommend that you go and take a listen to Jill Hormus. So we spoke with Jill on October 26th in 2016. Jill is an ultra endurance cyclist and runner and she talks about the Iditarod Trail and the Tour Divide. So Jill changed the direction of her life when she decided to move to Alaska to follow her heart. So almost very, very similar. After having her heart broken, she recovered while riding in the 2009 Tour Divide, a 2,745 mile mountain bike bike race along the continental divide from Banff, Alberta to Antelope Wells in New Mexico. So Jill shares more about her motivation. She discusses her fears and how she battles them and survives them every single day and also shares more about her life now. The other podcast episode I'd recommend is with Caroline, Dr. Caroline Van Hermit, uh, who we spoke with on April 23rd, 2019. And Caroline shares more about her 4,000 mile journey into the Alaskan wilds. So in March of 2012, Caroline and her husband Pat set off on a 4,000 mile wilderness journey from the Pacific rainforest to the Alaskan Arctic, traveling by rowboat, ski, foot, raft and canoe. Together they survived harrowing dangers while also experiencing incredible moments of joy and grace. Um, During the podcast, Caroline shares more about her love of nature and birds, plus why she decided to embark on this adventure. She talks through the planning, the logistics, the finance, the challenges faced and what she learned from this experience. Caroline's also also published her first book, which is called The Sun is a Compass, a 4,000 mile journey into the Alaskan wilds. So there are incredible episodes for you to go back and listen to, especially if you are brand new to the Tough Girl podcast. There's over 300 episodes for you to explore. We've spoken with runners, swimmers, mountaineers, everyday women running marathons. We've spoken to Paula Radcliffe, MBE, the fastest marathon runner of all time. Um, we've spoken with cyclists. We've spoken with paraclimbers. We've spoken with Olympians. We've spoken with grandmothers. There is a massive range of women. So please do go and check out toughgirlchallenges.com. My mission with Tough Girl Challenges is to increase the amount of female role models in the media, especially in relation to adventure and big physical challenges. If you would like to support the mission, then please do go and visit Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Tough Girl Podcast, where you can sign up to support the work that I do from $2, $5, $10, $10 a month. It really does make a massive difference. Every single patron will get their name on a dedicated patrons page on the Tough Girl website, and all female patrons are invited to join the closed Facebook group, the Tough Girl Tribe. Massive thank you again for subscribing. Please tell one friend about the Tough Girl Podcast, and I'll be back with you next Tuesday for another awesome episode but until then take care lots of love bye